if you look from the previous year, 2021 to 22, you can see this percentage jump here in cost of living is one of the most important factors that students make those decisions. Reputation is everything. We've all heard it and we all believe it. Be it building and monitoring your online reputation or measuring your resident satisfaction in real time, we all know how important that is. The truth is we spend too much time asking for reviews, responding to reviews, surveying our residents and analyzing those surveys. This is all important, but there needs to be an easier way to manage it all. And in student housing, sometimes there just needs to be an automatic way of managing it, like during turn or for move-in day. Well, there is one platform out there that does just that. It's called Opinion. Opinion integrates with your property management software to automatically ask residents for reviews so you can get real-time feedback. It also works to generate more positive online reviews and ratings completely in the background without you ever having to push out an email or a text message. You can build surveys that are automatically sent out based on certain events within a tenant's lease cycle or an ad hoc community-wide survey. And it's working behind the scenes to analyze all of that feedback and present it to you in a way that you can quickly understand your property's resident satisfaction level and get insight into your team's performance. Listen, there are a lot of platforms and applications that can help you monitor and respond to your online reputation. Some will even help you generate more reviews, but Opinion allows you to do it hands-free and brings you the feedback you need in order to take meaningful action. So let Opinion do the heavy lifting and give your team more time to focus on your tenants. For more information, click on the link in the show notes or go to Opinion, which is spelled with three I's, O-P-I-N-I-I-O-N.com forward slash S-H-I. Again, that's opinion.com forward slash SHI. Go there today and get a special promotion for our audience members. Hello and welcome to the Student Housing Insight Podcast, where we are putting you in touch with the people who bring student housing to life. I'm your host, Wesley Dees. I'm also the CEO and founder of Student Housing Insight. Yes, that's correct. Student Housing Insight is not only a podcast, but we're a platform for off-campus student housing professionals to connect, network, and learn. You can find out more info at studenthousinginsight.com. Well, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world, and a happy 2024. I hope you've had a great new year so far. We've got some amazing things planned here at Student Housing Insight for this year, and we've got some new events that we'll be talking about a little bit more as we get closer to when those are happening. We're also going to be adding a job board to our website, which is something that I know a lot of you guys have requested, and we are finally doing it. So be on the lookout for that. It should be up and operating on the website in just a couple of weeks. So exciting times around here, and if you are wanting to find out about everything that's happening this year, make sure that you go to our LinkedIn page or our Facebook page. Actually, go to both and give those a follow. All right, so let's talk about international students. We all know there was a massive drop in international student enrollment in fall of 2020 for students that were coming to the U.S. or anywhere for that matter because of the pandemic and and travel restrictions. So has that enrollment come back? Um, yes, it's it's been coming back. Every semester since fall of 21, I believe, it's been returning. I don't think it's quite back to where it was for fall of 2019, but it's inching back for sure. In fact, I, I wouldn't even call it inching. It's actually been making really great strides each semester. But here's the question. Where are they returning to? What schools are they choosing to attend? Has that changed? And I think most importantly, what countries are they coming from? Back in the fall, it was announced that India has surpassed China for being the largest, let's call it, exporter of students to U.S. higher ed institutions. 
those are important things for student housing professionals to to know. And, and this is why, uh, for example, students from, from India, they don't have the same socioeconomic background as Chinese students or especially a lot of students that come from the Middle East. They also have different goals when it comes to, you know, continuing post-graduation and, and that type of thing. And those things impact the type of housing that they're going to be looking for. And that's why we need to know. So earlier this month on Shop Talk, and if you don't know what Shop Talk is, it's the industry's monthly webinar that we host. We uh, do that typically the second Thursday of each month. But you can get more info and register to get the calendar invites at shoptalk.info. But anyway, in, in this this last one earlier this month, I interviewed Tanya Kramer from Oxford International Education Group. Uh, Oxford International helps students with really all of their accommodations when going to another country for education needs, specifically to the U.S. and to the U.K., and it's not just housing accommodations. You know, they take care of kind of everything from health insurance to transportation. So because of that, they've got a ton of data on international students and, you know, their modality when it comes to education. And a lot of that data can really help us as student housing professionals determine how we need to, to market to them, how we can best help, you know, with them, you know, not just in their housing needs, but how we can help connect them to their new campus community. So with that being said, let's get to my discussion with Tanya Kramer from Oxford International. Well, guys, let's talk a little bit about forecasting international student enrollment for this coming year. We've seen a lot of things change since the pandemic as it relates to having um, international students at our properties from, you know, beginning and, and, you know, fall of 2020 of just not being able to get students to the U S in order to enroll. And then we've had some kind of shifts that have happened, although we're seeing a lot of that enrollment come back to the 2019 levels. There's been a couple of shifts as far as where they're going to school at both as far as what country they're selecting and as well as what type of universities they're selecting. So I wanted to bring someone on that could give us some insight onto the data that they're following. And that is Tanya Kramer with with Oxford International. Tanya, if you will, I'll let you kind of give a little bit of an update on what Oxford International does. And then let's, uh, let's jump into the data that you've got. Sure. Thanks, Wes. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm the VP of higher ed for Oxford International Education Group. The company was founded in 1991, initially providing English language instruction that was in the UK, in Canada and the US. They expanded with some language assessment instruction and language assessment administration. And then in 2016, started branching out into what we call the pathway sector in the UK, in Canada, the US, and now in Australia as well. If you're not familiar with the pathway, it's just another entry route for university-bound students to begin their collegiate studies while they're also still improving their English. So it's like a conditional admission. So it's a usually a year or so, and then they progress into the rest of their degree. So we have in the U.S., we're relatively fresh. We've got two university partners, but are expanding quickly. And I've spent my my career in international ed and, and a variety of, of contexts. So I felt a little out of my depth listening to you guys talk about housing because I felt like I had some background from working adjacent to it and setting up new partnerships. So I hope I'll uh, be able to be helpful to you with the information I've got uh, that Wes. Well, I think so. You. And, you know, preparing for this, we obviously had, you know, some conversations about, you know, what what you've been seeing with, you know, some of those, some of those choices that students are making. And uh, I think it's, it's very relevant for, you know, how we need to be thinking about things as those students are, you know, finishing up what they're doing in their countries to you know, gain access to the, to the U S and with their visas and everything else. So I think, uh, yeah, let's, let's jump into it. First question. I think you've got your slides. I'm going to go ahead and put up this question though. We know fall 2023 saw an uptick in 
new international students enrolling. How did those numbers compare to fall of 2019? And I guess the real question is, have we made it back to pre-pandemic numbers? Yeah, great question and and one everyone's looking at very carefully. One of the best sources of information is the Open Door Study, which was just released in November of 2023. This is a historical view of international student enrollment in the U.S. You can see where COVID is and then you can see where we are now. I've got a little bit more granular detail, but that's the big picture. And I think it's important to reference when we consider forecasting as well. So looking more granularly, here you can see that in the last academic year, we had a total international enrollment of a little over a million, quite close to the pre-pandemic numbers. Um, And you can see how much it grew specifically in just the last year. Now, as, as we look forward to fall of 24. There are some predictions. Uh, Hello and IQ predicts worldwide international enrollment will continue to grow at about a rate of 4.2% through 2030. But the U.S. is falling a little bit behind with some of our competitors, which I'll speak to as well in a moment. But if you look at this, I would say from my experience in the industry, I would not expect to see this dramatic growth that we saw this past year um, in this current year, the 23-24 school year, and looking forward to 24-25. I think you're probably going to see something in the 5-ish percent range grow. So we'll continue to, to grow as this visual is meant to illustrate. Over time, I think we're going to continue to see students coming to the U.S., the rate of growth though, is, is going to be start slowing down a little bit from what it was as we got into the COVID recovery. Gotcha. So, you know, looking forward to, to fall of 24, what kind of projections does it look like for, for international enrollment as far as year over year? And, and where are we at right now with specifically with applications to U.S. institutions? Do you know if they're, if they're up, up or down or do we, is it too early to, to really know yet? For fall of 24, I think it's too early to know. A lot of um, institutions won't even issue I-20s, which students need to even apply for their visa. So it definitely varies dramatically. What we can see, um, which I think speaks to a little bit of, of what you're after, is where are these students where is the demand coming from? This is, again, is from Open Doors. This was from the 22-23 data period. And so any official data is going to be a year behind. I've got some you know, more up-to-date information I'll be sharing as well. But Open Doors is a focus on higher, higher ed institutions. And so you can see here from the previous school year what has been consistent in most of the past years that China and India is simply for pure volume numbers are going to be bringing in the most students. But at the bottom, you'll note a source of data where we can get just a a little bit more up-to-date information is from the Stevis data mapping and the study in the states from the Department of Homeland Security. That's showing, which I'm sure you must have seen in the news, that India has now surpassed China in that particular demographic. So I think with respect to to fall, with international students, again, I, I would fall back on what I mentioned a moment ago, which is I think we're going to continue to see about a four to a five percent increase from this past year. And as those numbers are revealed, we'll figure out exactly what that is. But I think the growth that we saw in the past year will slow just a bit. The growth specifically from India or? No, overall. 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 Gotcha. So, no, in fact, quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I go, going back to this. India taking over over China. I mean, from a Chinese standpoint, we're obviously seeing a lot more Chinese students going to to Canada. Should we continue to see you know China pulling back as far as international recruitment, or as far as us recruiting from from China, and kind of vice versa, them trying to enroll in U.S. universities? So again, pulling from the most recent data. So the most recent data published by the Department of Homeland Security is from November of 2023. So I went through and provided a sort of sampling of both a fall and a March or a sp- or early spring data going back about eight years. The point I want to make here, though, is that these two data sources, the Open Doors, which is a focus on higher ed and 
CVIS, which is a focus on higher ed as well as K-12 and English language training. Those are, it's two different sets of data, but they trend together. So in case you are wondering uh, if certain values are exactly right on some slides other than others, I wanted to bring that to your attention. So you can see here, and last November, quite close, and then pulling ahead this past spring where international students from India, that source is, and, and I want you to see specifically also how dramatically this increase is just in this past fall. Quite remarkable. And part of that was some investment in the U.S. in getting India student visa applications processed more quickly and providing more resources to do that. Unfortunately, we're not quite seeing that for spring. But I think the story here with China and India also talks about needs to look at the type of students, which is something I'm prepared to, to chat about next. When we're looking at the overall growth from India, where that's coming from is a graduate student population, which I would imagine has uh, less of an impact on your industry than say the undergraduate does as, as I was just listening. So if you look overall, uh, the change from the last two years, there was a 21% increase overall in the graduate students, whereas you can see undergrad is almost uh, non-existent yeah. change in the number from international students, which I think is something to keep in mind. With China specifically, though, here's the story. Well, the, real, real quick, let oh, me just make a, a comment for the sure. audience on that, because when we think about graduate students, you know, that are in our in our markets, we we typically just kind of take them out of the pool because you know they're they're typically they could be a professional, you know, that's getting their their MBA or a PhD or whatever, and They've either got their own house or, you know, they're renting a one bedroom somewhere. Typically, they don't even want to live in purpose-built student accommodations. So, you know, we just don't really try to target them unless if the, the property has been specifically built for them. But when it comes to graduate international students, that's a little bit different. Yes, indeed. I'm kind of wondering from your standpoint, what's, what's kind of the key things that a graduate student from you know, from these countries are, are thinking about when they think about housing, you know, are they, is it all about money and, and keeping their expenses low? Is it being able to immerse themselves in the, in the U S culture and, you know, they want to have roommates. Can you kind of give us a little bit of an idea of, of what may be different between a international graduate student versus, you know, an undergrad student from, from another country? Sure. That's going to have me hopping ahead, but I'm happy to do that. So <laughs> this, that. that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm flexible. So this is my experience. I've, like I said, I've been in this industry um, for over 30 years now. I use oil with LA. I look a little bit younger than I am, but, um, and, and working with over 50 different university partners all throughout the U.S. as well as in the U.K., what we started seeing, which is when India really started coming up, which is this grad, international grad population I'm talking about. If you think back at some of the earlier slides when I was showing the areas of growth, we're looking at Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, all of those South Asian countries, they are very price sensitive. And so at one point in the industry, we were targeting our off-campus housing opportunities for students catering to the, the uh, luxury market. So students coming in from China, coming in from the Middle East with lots of money, wanting amenities and privacy. Then we started as the demographic shifted. That wasn't working anymore. Our students coming in, our grad students coming in from India wanted roommate matching, flexible uh, lease terms, doubling up where they could have like a bunk bed, like a, say, take your studio apartment, putting a bunk bed in there and having that rented out to two students sharing a, um, a bathroom or a, a double and doubling up in there. So having four students in, in a double, similar to kind of how you might do in a dorm, that's what these grad students were looking for. They also find it much more convenient to have their rental cost be inclusive of all the other utilities. So electricity, water, and Wi-Fi being the most important ones. But if there are other services that are charged, such as waste removal and, and that sort of thing, there is a lot of emphasis and, and can be challenging for an international student to make payments. Um, they might not be coming from an American bank and that it's costly to make separate payments every month. Mm -hmm. Having a 
a housing facility that wraps all of those expenses together is also very, particularly for this price sensitive grad population is very, very helpful. Flexible lease terms is another, as you know, in the in grad programs, you're gonna see a lot more flexibility, whereas most universities follow a typical three semesters a year schedule. Some are on a quarterly schedule, but a lot of universities for graduate programs are running both. So for instance, our partner in New York City has some grad programs running on a three term schedule and some running on a four quarter. And the ability to commit to only a term at a time, so those short term leases, that's gonna be also really beneficial to students. You can see here the other things that I think you probably are already aware of. I will bring up the partnering because that's where I have really found a lot of opportunities. If you take a, a company like Oxford International, if we are partnering with a new university and we're predicting a, a, a strong ability to recruit into that university, which we would if we because there's another reason to do it right we want to make sure those students are getting housing and we're hearing it a huge crunch in a lot of areas on the housing market they're not being housing available and so some things that i've done in the past are working with off-campus housing providers or purpose-built housing housing to sublease so that i know that i can guarantee housing to a certain student population other things we did will work out referral arrangements where you can have institutes like the company that i work for actually promoting your your housing if you're needing to to fill beds so that's that's another way that you can attract these students to your to your facilities gotcha and, and guys this is as we're getting close to the top of the hour i just want to remind everybody you know tanya's got a, a ton of resources and and data that she's looking over all the time and if you've got any questions now would be a fantastic time to to put those in and we'll try to get those answered before we end the webinar here. But let's talk really quick. I, I think you were about to to get into it. Just as far as recruiting, what are some of the challenges that you know you guys are? I want to say you guys. I know there's other recruiters that you guys are obviously working with. What are some of the things that are kind of um, uh, challenging for you guys this year? This is a, a study that most folks in our uh, industry referred to its tribals I graduate international student barometer again published in 2023 from previous years but I want you to look at the most dramatic increase in decision factor and this is among students all over the world so students international students going to study in the UK Australia Canada Ireland Germany you name it if you look from the previous year, 2021 to 22, you can see this percentage jump here in cost of living is one of the most important factors as students make those decisions. Now, that's about which institution they're, they're choosing. You can look at other data that talks about the actual country, right? What country am I choosing? So that's that's the thing. The U.S. is actually starting to lose a little bit of our, um, quite a bit of our market share, in fact, to other countries such as Australia, who's done a lot to attract students to, to that country. But you can also see that that affordability of living and the cost of tuition as well is ranks relatively high all over the world as students make their decisions, even just about which country to choose from. We do find in the historical data that the student typically chooses which country they're going to study before they choose what university they're going to study at, right? It's driven first by, by that geography before they actually start getting into the universities themselves. As you look, again, not to belabor this, but it's just such, it cannot be overstressed. Looking again, these are students choosing to study in the US, Australia, Canada, all over the world. China, number one concern, safety, India, our second cost of living, India, number one concern, cost of living, Vietnam, number one cost of concern, um, concern, cost of living. This is becoming more and more crucial to helping attract international students to your to your housing efforts for institutions attracting them to their to their programs as well, um, which is why the things I mentioned earlier about roommate matching and flexible lease terms and doubling up and having the utilities included. So taking a look at maybe which which of your fill rates aren't as strong for uh, whether it's those studios and those one bedrooms and figuring out how to package those differently to students who aren't probably going to want to pay the premium to to have that privacy. Uh, 
that makes sense. And, and yeah, and I think distance is a is a big thing. I mean, that's where you know we saw a lot of development in this industry. You know, in the early two thousands, that were more garden style, mile plus from from campus, and those are a little bit more affordable these days uh, versus the you know kind of high rise infill type of stuff that's pedestrian to campus. So, hey, we've got a quick question here from Dylan Webster. He wants to know, do you see any trend in the average international student's ability to qualify for off-campus housing? I think you, you know, kind of answered that a little bit in that, in that last slide, but are they coming over with... Yeah, a document they have to have before they can even apply for a visa. They have to provide the educational institution with a financial affidavit or some proof of funding. And they're required to show that they have enough money to cover the full tuition for an entire year, as well as housing, dining, transportation. It's quite a large sum. And so that typically isn't a problem with respect to qualifying. What can be a problem for off-campus housing are things like lease agreements, not understanding saying that students not going to have a social security number and they're, and they're not going to be able to provide you with credit references because they're coming from a different country. And so having an understanding of their, their unique circumstances with your traditional lease agreement, I think is probably more of a concern than, than being able to afford it. Yeah. I'm not going to make any specific plugs, but there are a couple of companies out there that will, uh, that will guarantee those leases. So certainly would recommend you look into to who those are. Hey, I, as we're ending up here, there's a question that came from prior to this as I was you know, kind of getting things prepared. I went out to our leadership committee for Shop Talk and said, hey, are there any additional questions? And and Laura from Micah with Core Spaces had this. And I felt like it was pretty important. Uh, any insights into the state of the mental health amongst international students and how can U.S. operators better support these young people as they navigate life in a new country. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. And I love the question. Um, I wish more people asked it. <laughs> I did grab some data because this is close to my heart as, as a or starting off in student services and as an adjunct faculty member. So if you look here again, this is an international student survey. I think it's telling that you know, 17% of students are very comfortable or uncomfortable even asking a university for support. Culturally, students are not comfortable reaching out and don't know how to navigate the U.S., you know, health insurance and medical yeah. service industries. And so no, I have a hard time navigating that. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so do I. I'm not going to read through this, but you can see for yourself Although we know that students are uncomfortable asking for help, and although we know they are less apt, in fact, most health insurance companies bank on that and pad their cost, knowing that an international student is much less likely to use their medical insurance than, than a domestic student, even though this is true, I think what's telling here is how important these students are starting to rank the fact that the, the university would offer those things. There are a few wonderful supplementary agencies that provide uh, multilingual uh, mental health counseling. But I, th I think the most important factor here in supporting these students is having someone, an advisor that can be a conduit for the student to walk them over to the healthcare center or to the counseling center or having, for instance, companies like us that have a presence on campus or international student service offices or have coming into dorms and, and other, um, we've done this with off-campus housing providers as well and bringing those services into the students to make it easier for them to access. Gotcha. Well, I, we're at the top of the hour here, and I know Nick's got a, a fantastic question here. I, I don't know if you've got a quick, uh, quick answer to that. Um, I don't. <laughs> I think that there are so many variables in understanding where students are getting aid from, from their home countries. I don't even know where a source of that information would be, whereas this other stuff is, is kind of out there all the time. Gotcha. Um, it's a great question, but I certainly don't know that. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, in case we repurpose this for the podcast later, the question from Nick is, is the cost of living concern spiking a result of students getting less aid from their home country and or other factors? So, yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. We'll have to Nick, I'll see if I see if there's any sources out there or not. <laughs> Maybe we can get back to that. 
Tanya, I want to thank you for for the time you've put together and and putting this presentation together. And and thanks for the help that you've given me over the past week and kind of going through some of this stuff. And hopefully we can have you back on Shop Talk and the SHI podcast here in the near near future. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, y'all. I hope it was helpful. Feel free to reach out as well. Wes can uh, get in touch with me if you have any other questions or would like these uh, sources of information I'm happy to provide. Once everything goes up, the replay goes up, I'll make sure your email information and everything is there as well. So guys, the next uh, Shop Talk will be um, on a Tuesday, not a Thursday, Tuesday, February 13th. So right before, before Valentine's Day. Uh, we've got something special planned for that day. We're going to be on our special segment. We'll be talking about social media for 2024 and what operators need to know. We've got Sam Wynn and Alex Abernathy and Matt Pavlik, all from uh, marketing agencies. So make sure that you tune in for that. You get more information at shoptalk.info as far as registering for that. Guys, thanks so much. If you've gotten any value out of what we've provided today, please share this with your colleagues. And again, they can register to get the calendar invites at shoptalk.info. Have a great day, everyone. Again, a big thanks to Tanya for taking the time out of her schedule to present at Shop Talk. And speaking of Shop Talk, our next one will be Tuesday, February 13th. I'm really excited about our focus segment on this one. The title is What Operators Need to Know About Social Media in 2024. Uh, Things are, are constantly evolving in social media, especially with the advertising portion of it. So it's a perfect time here at the beginning of the year to catch up with some of the guys that Pay way more attention to it than I do, and I'm sure that you do as well. Our panel for that segment will include Matt Pavlik with Grow Marketing, Alex Abernathy with Poetic and Asset Living, and Sam Wynn with Agency 53. These guys all work for or run marketing agencies, and they've got both of their hands on the pulse of what is trending in social media, but they also have the other hand on student housing operations, and they can speak our language. So I felt like it was really important that we speak with them at the beginning of this year and talk about some of the changes that they know, you know, have either recently happened or things that are certainly being discussed and and things that these companies are trending towards. So again, if you want to register for that, just go to shoptalk.info. You can scroll down and click on the register to receive shop talk updates. That's the best one to, to click on because that will actually get you monthly invites, calendar invites to each shop talk. So make sure that you do that. You can always go to shoptalk.info and at the top left hand corner, it'll be the, the one for that month. So if it's, for example, on February 13th, if you log in on February 11th, that link on the top left hand corner will go to the registration. If you go in on, on February 14th, happy Valentine's Day, by the way you will basically go to the replay and that will be there, you know, through the rest of the month. So keep that in mind as well. But yeah, I would click on register to receive shop talk updates and that will make sure that you get a, an email, actually a couple emails. We usually send one a week out and then another one a couple days beforehand. So you've got time to register. Well, with that being said, please, if you've gotten any value out of this episode, please share it with a colleague or a (laughs) hundred. We we really, really do appreciate our referrals and certainly means the world to me. I also want to thank Opinion for being the sponsor of this episode. If you're not currently utilizing any kind of platform or process to measure your resident satisfaction and to generate positive reviews, or if you're using something that it requires your staff members to ask for a positive review, which means you're probably losing out on 90% of the positive reviews that you could be getting, then get in touch with Opinion. They've got a special discount for the listeners of this podcast. We'll provide the link in the show notes, but it is Opinion, and that's spelled with three I's, O-P-I-N-I-I-O-N.com forward slash S-H-I. Again, that will be in the show notes. Well, again, thanks again, and we'll see you next time.